Hello and welcome back to the Hutchin School Chemistry Lab. I'm Dr. James and today we'll be talking about the structures of functional groups. Now these are going to be the new functional groups studied in Task 4 Chemistry and will carry on from the assumed knowledge from Physical Sciences Task 3. Let's get to it. So the functional group of a molecule is the part of the molecule that determines how the chemical reacts in any environment. There are many functional groups including alkenes, alkanes, alkynes, and halogen groups. And these are the ones that you've already studied. In our course, we're going to add the following. We won't be doing them in that order in this presentation. We'll be following a little bit more of a logical process through the synthesis, although we won't be talking about synthesis at all today, just introducing these functional groups and getting a hold of some of the rules about how we name them. There'll be practice questions for each type as we move through, and I'll put in a little pause after I show you each structure to give you a chance to apply the rules on that slide and previous slides to name it. First up, we're going to be talking about alcohols. Now, alcohols are defined by the OH functional group. This is not a hydroxide. A hydroxide is an inorganic molecule, whereas this is an organic fragment or organic functional group, and therefore there is no similarity here between the basic OH and the alcoholic OH. Alcohols occur when carbon is bonded to an OH, and that changes the chemistry of it. When we're naming alcohols, we change the suffix, that's the bit at the end of the name, and whatever was an E now becomes an OL, or an OL. Here's our first and most simple example, see if you can name this one. That's methanol. The next example is shown here. That one is ethanol. This is the alcohol that we drink and is responsible for getting intoxicated. It's actually toxic to the human body, which is why you can get dizziness, vomiting, and all the other symptoms of alcohol, including alcohol poisoning. Vodka is about a 40% solution of ethanol and the rest is water with a little bit of flavoring in it as well. Finally, we have this species, which I hope that you can name based on our rules for multiple functional groups that we looked at in physical sciences. This is methane diol. It's going to become a bit of a feature that the suffix retains the E for molecules that have multiple functional groups of the same type. Let's have a look at some more advanced alcohols now. The rules are exactly the same, but the questions are a little bit more complicated. Let's see how you go. This is propane 1, 2, diol. The numbering needs to start from the right hand side, not the left hand side, because like always, we're trying to minimize the numbering. We need to include both the numbers 1 and 2 and the di modifier to indicate that there are two and to give each of their locations. Propane 1, 1, diol would occur if these two substituents were to swap. Next up in our advanced alcohols is this one. This is butuene 2 ol Our third advanced alcohol is this one, which is butuene 1,3-diol. And again, dialcohols retain the E of their suffix. Key features of aldehydes are that the carbon chain is bonded to a carbon, which is double bonded to an oxygen, and also bonded to a hydrogen. It looks like this, and it's abbreviated as a semi-structural formula like this. Because of the three bonds that are on this key carbon here, you can't have an aldehyde in the middle of a chain. With aldehydes, the suffix is modified. The E of the ane, ene, or ine becomes al. Here's some examples. This first one is methanol. Moving on. This is ethanol. And finally, this is ethane diol, and as we've seen previously, dialdehydes also retain the E of their suffix. Moving on to our advanced aldehydes now, here's our example. This is called prop2-ene-al. We don't need to number where the aldehyde is because we know that the aldehyde has to be on the end of a functional group chain, and this dictates the numbering uh, of the species. If this were simply an alkene, we would number one from the right-hand side and two in the middle because we'd be minimizing the number of the double bond. But the aldehyde takes precedence, it's more electronegative, and so it becomes carbon number one, and the alkene must start on two and move through to carbon number three. Ketones are very similar to aldehydes, except the hydrogen that was on the terminal aldehyde is replaced by a carbon. So this is a C double bond O that is in the middle of a chain. Just like aldehydes had to be on the end of a carbon chain, ketones cannot be on the end of a carbon chain. And with a ketone, the suffix E of ane, ene, or ine becomes own. Here's the smallest example of a ketone. This is propanone. 
This is actually more commonly known as acetone and you may have run into this uh, in nail polish remover or other household chemicals. Our next example is here. This is pentan 2 ohm Because we have a molecule that has two possible locations for the C double bond O or the carbonyl group as it is called, C double bond O is called carbonyl, we have to specify the number. We could have pentan 3 ohm if the carbonyl group was in the center, but it is not in this case, it is offset of center. And this is a symmetrical molecule about this center point. So there is no such thing as pentan 4 ohm. Just like always, the numbering is designed to minimize the first number. Our advanced ketone example is given here. This is pentane 2,4-dione. Don't forget to identify the location of our ketone or our carbonyl groups because we could have had a three included in this numbering scheme, which would be the center position here. Instead, we have carbonyl groups in the two and four position. And we see that diketones also retain the E of their suffix. Moving on now to carboxylic acids. The key feature of a carboxylic acid is the carbon bonded to the OH here and also the double bond to oxygen. This is not an alcoholic group because of this double bond to oxygen and nor is it a ketone because of this OH seen here. This must be viewed all together and this particular arrangement of atoms indicates a carboxylic acid. In naming carboxylic acids, the suffix E is modified to oic acid. And so we have this first example here this is ethanoic acid, also known as acetic acid. This is the acid that we have in vinegar at a concentration of about four to 7%. Our next carboxylic acid is shown here. This is butanoic acid. This one happens to smell like vomit, but you don't need to know that. It's just another fun fact from Dr. James. Our final simple carboxylic acid is here. And this one is butane dioic acid. And again, diacids retain the E of their suffix. Because carboxylic acids are terminal, just like aldehydes, they have to be on the end of a chain. I don't have any particularly difficult examples of carboxylic acids for you. I think the dioic acid probably is the most complicated in naming until we start mixing up functional groups, which we'll do in a future video. So next up we have esters. Now esters are a very interesting structure. I'll work through this one with you. What I wanna show you today is how the structure works. And in fact, it's easy to see all the way through with an example. You make an ester by mixing an alcohol with a carboxylic acid and removing water. When we're naming, this orange section here becomes the first part of the name and its suffix is modified to an il. So in this case, this is methyl, and then we're looking at what the next part of the chain is gonna be. The suffix of the chain with the double bond to oxygen is also modified. The E of ain, ene, or ein becomes O8. In this case, we have two carbons. So this is an ethan O8. So this particular molecule is called methyl ethanoate. The first name chain is the one after the single bond oxygen, and the second name chain is the one with the double bond oxygen. So let's have a go at naming this next example, which is given here. This is ethyl methanoate. So if you've got the names wrong when switched around, this is the difference in chemical compound that you're making. Methyl ethanoate and ethyl methanoate are very different from each other. Obviously, we could also have methyl methanoate and ethyl ethanoate, but neither of those are shown here. Let's have a look at a more complicated ester structure and see how we go with naming. I've collapsed the text down a little bit so that we can fit this one in, and here is the structure. This is chloromethyl 2 bromoethanoate. It's unlikely that you're gonna be asked a question as complicated as this. This is chloromethyl because it would be chloromethane if it weren't attached to our ester. And this is 2 bromoethanoate because it would be bromoethane if we didn't have any other substituents. Now the ester group is more important than the halogens and so that dictates that this carbon is carbon number one, making this carbon number two and requiring us to name this as 2-bromoethanoate. The full name there, chloromethyl-2-bromoethanoate. Don't forget the space in the ester name between the two chains. Next up, we'll be looking at amines, which is the first time that we're introducing nitrogen into our compound. 
amines are defined by the NH2 functional group and otherwise behave quite a lot like alcohols. In an amine, the suffix is modified. The E of anine or ein becomes amine. Let's have a look at this. This is the simplest of the amines and in fact isn't an amine. This isn't hydrogen amine. This is ammonia. Our next example is a more genuine amine. Here it is. This is methanamine. Let's move on to our final example now. Methane diamine. And again, diamines retain the E in their suffix. Moving on to more advanced amines. Here we have our first example. This is propan 1 amine. And our next example. This is but 2 ene 2 amine. Finally, this is but 2 ene 1 3 diamine. And again, diamines retain the E of their suffix. As with all of these chemicals, we are numbering to minimize the first numbers. So this molecule would always be a but2ene. However, we could have a but2ene24-diamine or a but2ene13-diamine. And by the minimizing number rule, but2ene13-diamine is preferred and hence correct. It's also important to note that amines have multiple naming options, which we'll be discussing in a later video. Moving on now to amides, these are the cousin to carboxylic acids. They are one carbon double bonded to oxygen and the same carbon is single bonded to nitrogen which also has two hydrogens attached to it. This is an amide, it's neither a ketone nor an amine. This is its own distinct class of compounds because it has its own distinct chemistry. Amides are defined as shown here and naming amides like all of these things we're modifying the suffix, the E becomes amide. Let's have a go at a simple example. This is ethanamide, moving on now. This is butanamide or butanamide, depending on your pronunciation. I always prefer butanamide because it's consistent with the way I'm pronouncing all of these things. Our final example is given here. This is propane diamide. And again, notice that the diamides retain the E of the suffix. We don't need to number our amide position, just like the carboxylic acid and the aldehyde. Since it's a terminal group with three bonds, it must be on the end of a chain. And so the amide is defining itself as carbon number one and can only exist on the end of carbon chains. Moving on now to our final group, we have the alkoxides. Now these are modified alcohols that have lost the hydrogen from the OH group of the alcohol. That hydrogen has moved on, leaving an anion, and a cationic metal has come in and is associated with this alcohol anion in an ionic bonding fashion. When we're naming these, we name the metal cation first, followed by a space. The suffix of the alcohol is modified and the ol becomes oxide. Let's have a look. This is lithium ethan oxide. Let's have a look at a couple more advanced examples. Here we have sodium butene 2 oxide. And one final example. This is potassium butene 1 3 dioxide. We don't need to say dipotassium. Just as for sodium sulfate, we don't have to say disodium sulfate. We need to simply say the sodium sulfate. This is following the same ionic naming rules, and we don't need to specify the number of potassiums because that's determined by the number of negative charges in the anion. So this is but2ene 1,3-dioxide and again we're following this retaining the E of the suffix because we have two oxide groups. That's it for our introduction to our new functional groups. I hope it all made sense and I'll see you guys next time. <laughs>